Um, today we have uh, Professor Marion Dawkins who will be talking to us about um, chickens. Yes, chicken chicken behavior. So sorry about this. I I, I didn't plan to start about President Rafi just ran off, so I'm just impromptu introduction. So yeah, I hope you enjoy the talk. Professor Dawkins. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, I've become extremely worried about political debates that are going on when people talk about climate change, feeding people. They talk about food security, they talk about things being sustainably intensive, but they hardly ever talk about animal welfare. If you look at what some of the things the UN has uh, produced, they talk about the effect that livestock has on, uh, the, on the earth. But they call for limiting land, more intensification, greater use of technology. They hardly mention um, animal welfare. The same is true of the UK government. They had um, uh, something which was looking at the uh, um, future of food and farming. And as you can see, they identified priorities, virtually no mention of, um, of, of animal welfare. And uh, even more so, if we look at uh, what um, the United Nations has produced uh, more recently, um, we, we see that actually, again, limit the land, become more efficient, and as I say, animal welfare seems to get left um, out of the picture. So my concern has been, how can we actually uh, get animal welfare back onto the, uh, onto the political uh, agenda? Efficient pro food production if you look about plants, there isn't much of a problem. We're talking about plants that perhaps use less water, don't need the seeds plowed in. I don't have any problems with efficient plant production. But if we're talking about animals, efficient means basically producing more meat, more milk, more eggs, for less space, less food, um, less water. And that, it seems to me, has uh, uh, a number of implications. Um, in fact, uh, in many people's eyes, this drive for efficiency has already resulted in welfare problems. And the question what's going to happen to animal welfare if we have pressure for even more um, efficiency? Um, for example, uh, we can look at the farm animals we already have. They are very efficient. Dairy cows produce an enormous amount of milk, but they only usually live two or three years because it's so aggressive. Exhausted by the end of that time. Laying hens don't live more than a year. They lay large numbers of eggs, and it, uh, so many eggs, they put calcium into eggshells, uh, and uh, they have damaged, brittle bones. And the animal I work on, um, which is um, the broiler chicken, again, an extremely efficient, it's been bred to. Um, put on weight, grow very, very efficiently. If you eat chicken, that chicken is almost likely that less than 35 days old. So it goes from fluffy little chicken to, to chicken tikka masala in less than 35 days. And we have now a world production of 60 billion of these, uh, of these birds. They are already um, highly efficient. Um, they grow much faster than they did 50 years ago. And um, they convert 1.5 kilograms of food into one kilogram of meat, and that's pretty efficient. Um, that compares pretty well uh, with um, 
uh, the, uh, cattle, which tend to be about nine or ten to one, pigs, sheep, and they are already pretty efficient as they are. Um, and the current problems with this very fast growth rate include heart failure, difficulty in walking, and so on. And people are seriously talking about chickens who are going to convert 1.2 kilograms of food into one kilogram of meat uh, and be about 23 days old when they're killed by 2020. I mean, you, you really do begin to say, well, if that's going to happen, uh, what is going to happen to Um, so basically, what uh, we've uh, been, uh, been doing um, is, is, is really sort of saying, well, well, is there a, a conflict in this uh, between efficient food production and animal welfare? We're going to be able to feed the world, we're going to in, uh, improve uh, efficiency of food production. Is it inevitable that that will be at the cost of animal welfare? Or are there ways um, in which we can uh, begin to make sure that animal welfare uh, becomes part of sustainable food production. I find a very interesting question. If we're doing that, do we do that by standing on the sidelines and trying to persuade people that animals matter and that you should behave ethical, ethically to them? Or should you do it uh, by actually uh, showing that there's a good case, a good, a good financial uh, case um, for um, uh, uh, good welfare? Does good welfare pay? or does good welfare cost? And I, I think one of the problems is um, that there is a conflict here. Um, people, some people will pay uh, extra for animals that are produced in a high welfare way. But one of the problems that people have encountered is if you uh, question people on the way in to a supermarket, that's, oh yes, oh yes, I'm very interested in animal welfare. Oh yes, I'll pay extra for animal welfare. When they get in there and they're confronted uh, with a chicken um, uh, that costs two pounds or one that costs 12 pounds for a producer in a high welfare way, they'll go for the two pound one. So it, it is, it's very flaky. There is a conflict. I don't think you can actually uh, rely on people uh, enough, that there being enough rich people prepared to pay more for, for, for good welfare. Um, is the conflict uh, inevitable? Um, I think one of the, uh, the things which we've been working on um, is to find uh, ways of trying to make good welfare pay uh, by finding better, better ways of, um, uh, uh, of, of linking it to other priorities that people already have. Um, and also, as I'm going to describe, using technology uh, which will um, improve uh, animal welfare. Uh, as well as productivity. And I think, first of all, we, we, I'd like to uh, start with uh, uh, ways of reducing this conflict. Um, and first of all, a definition. A, a good definition of animal welfare, one that is a working definition, everybody goes, um, can understand it, um, is uh, that the animal is healthy and the animal has, it has what it wants. Now, uh, it's a, it's a practical way of looking at animal welfare, but it's, it's quite a useful uh, thing to have. Most people would agree that health is absolutely fundamental to welfare, and there's something extra. The extra is, can the animal do what it wants? Can it behave naturally? Can it do uh, that kind of thing? So I'm going to use that as a, as a practical definition with, a, uh, with a, uh, an emphasis on, on, on health. The advantage of this is that most people understand it. It's, uh, it can actually uh, uh, work for whoever you are, a scientist, consumer. It shows what evidence we need to use in practice, and it shows where the conflict areas are. Is there a conflict between animal health and, um, for example, uh, and uh, uh, production? And it's pretty obvious. Good health is going to be very good for production, so we, we, we can play on that. And I think it's very, very important that we don't consider animal welfare on its own. It's got to be integrated with these other environmental priorities that people have. Uh, they've got to be uh, an integration with, with uh, economics and, and so on. In many ways, animal welfare has a lot to learn from conservation, as you probably know. Some conservationists try and persuade uh, make the argument for conservation by talking about ethics and saying, our forest is beautiful. And other ones have actually
actually said, no, the only way to really get uh, safety for the environment is to stress the monetary value of uh, 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 having forests that you, if you, if you have clean water, um, if you have good soil, uh, if you have a variety of other things, uh, then uh, you're, going to, you're going to benefit. There's money in conserving these things. And that's a much more effective way of, of preserving uh, the environment than just appealing to ethics or people's aesthetics. And I think very much the same argument uh, has got to be applied now to animal welfare. Because after all, good welfare ticks many boxes. You have lower mortality, you have lower waste, you're therefore um, uh, uh, you're, um, ticking the efficiency box. You have less damage to the animals, so you have a higher quality of product. You have a lower disease level, so you have, uh, again, a higher, uh, lower risk of human infection. You use less medication, which I think the is a good idea. It carries across cultures, uh, which I think is very important. That, that we can, we can, everybody wants healthy food. Not everybody agrees that animal welfare is, is important. And it's much, much more likely to be adopted by producers if they can see a commercial value in it. So, although what I'm saying is quite controversial, some people think animal welfare should be done for its own sake. I actually spend quite a lot of my time talking to some large food producers because I think that's really the only way to put animal welfare on, on, a, on a safe, um, a safe footing. So what we've been doing is trying to assess welfare, in this case, broiler chickens, automatically using a bit of kit, which I'll describe in a moment, and helping the big commercial producers to manage their flocks so that they are healthier, have higher welfare, and they are more efficient. To resolve the conflict by saying, if you like, you can have all. Uh, and that, that's the aim to try and uh, to deliver that. And the system, as I'll describe it, gives early warnings of problems. So the farmer can take targeted uh, interventions. He can take only give medication to a particular flock if he really, really needs it, so he can lower his level of, of medication. And it provides a very inexpensive and easy to way, uh, easy, uh, way of uh, looking at lots of different information, which could be important. Now, you may know that actually, um, agriculture has become pretty computerized, or is gradually becoming computerized. Um, there are some amazing systems of automatic milking for cows, um, in which the computer knows exactly which cow has come, the cows choose when they go to be milked, um, and then the computer knows which it is, because it's got a little um, uh, uh, tag on its, a uh, radio tag on its, uh, its ankle or around its neck. Delivers exactly the right amount of food for that cow. The, um, the, the milking machine comes up and fits over the others. It knows whether the others are slightly different shape or slightly swollen from the day before. Everything is computerized, it's, it, it's done, there's, there's no people there at all. So the dairy industry is highly computerized. Pig industry, very often you have pigs that have a, a tag on them and they go to eat and there's a diet actually specially mixed for that particular pig. So, that's, the farming is becoming more and more um, uh, computerized in that way. But the poultry industry uh, actually uh, is lagged quite far behind. And the reason is, of course, that individual chickens are less valuable commercially than individual cows or pigs. And the dairy farmer, each of his cows is valuable. It matters to him uh, both here at the end profit of this farm, that that individual cow is healthy and has some good welfare. It doesn't matter with an individual chicken. I mean, the margin on an individual broiler chicken would be about 30p. So it, it, it doesn't matter so much. And there are so many of them, because I, I think you have a flocks of up to 50,000 birds in one shed. You can't possibly keep track of all the individuals. So we need a different approach, which is suitable for large numbers of, of, of animals, does not have tagging because you couldn't like, tag 50,000 birds and then get all the tags off before they went off to market. It would be impossible. Um, and you can't actually have visual tracking by a computer of 50,000 identical white birds because it would actually drive a computer mad as the you know, chickens come together and be one big chicken keeping track of it. it, just, it it's, it's out of the question. 
So I worked um, with Steve Roberts in engineering, and he said, we're not going down that route. Uh, we're going down the route of flock level measures um, of, um, uh, for, for, for measuring behavior. So uh, Steve Roberts in engineering is my main uh, um, contact. Martin Layden and Adrian Smith are bacteriologists in zoology, um, and um, uh, we work uh, as a team of, of bacteriologists, engineers, and the welfare scientists. I work with um, Cargill, which is I think the biggest private company in the world, I think, uh, and they certainly have, they have a, a, a very large chicken industry. Hook Two Sisters and Cargill together make up, I think, about 50% of the UK poultry market. So. We're working with some quite uh, big companies, and Cargill supply, uh, if you like, the ones, uh, so the, the stakes are quite high, I mean, the, the, the players are quite high. Um, so, um, we, if I could just say that, that most of the current methods of assessing the welfare of broiler chickens are done when the birds are dead. After they after they're dead, they make, they look at various things. They look at um, they look at the, the legs and feet when they're in, when they're in the when they're in the slaughterhouse, um, and they um, uh, assess them. They look at the, the, the number that have died. But the main measure of welfare is how many died, which shows you how well crude the current uh, the current measures are. Um, we developed a system that works either on a smartphone. Um, and uses the camera um, and the computer and the smartphone to do the processing of the video in real time. Or a tiny computer uh, which is in a waterproof box and has two cameras attached to it. And so the data is, is analysed in real time. And uh, we, uh, what we do is obviously putting up the cameras and getting the video is the easy part. Um, and what we've been using is something called optical flow, which does not store images, which gets around all the problems of the farm staff worrying that big brother is filming them or anything. And because it doesn't store images, it just churns out four numbers every 15 minutes, um, there's, uh, it, it can store lots and lots, and so it can be around for um, a very long time. Um, optical flow is basically the rate of change of image brightness. If you imagine um, a video frame divided up into squares, it could be pixels, but in fact we, we use uh, uh, 8 by 8 pixel squares. And if you imagine white objects on a black background, and if you imagine the going through time, successive images in time, if the white objects stay still, all the white squares will remain white, and all the black squares black. But if the white objects start moving, then some of the white squares will become black and vice versa. And it's this rate of change of image brightness, which is the optical flow. So if there's movement, then you're going to get uh, this, this optical flow um, occurring. Um, and so, for example, if there are successive frames of uh, chickens in a house, you're looking at the, the changing pattern of light and dark. You're not tracking individuals. You're just looking at the flow of image brightness um, and over time. And um, the first study we did, which was on a commercial farm, was just simply to see whether this uh, optical flow system showed anything interesting at all about the flocks. So the way we did that was to have uh, the basic measures that the companies were doing anyway, how many birds died, what their legs and feet were like at the slaughter plant and so on. We were on the farm looking at how well they walked, literally scoring each individual, a sample of individual birds for how well they walked. And then we took uh, four statistical measures from uh, the video. The mean, which is pretty obvious, the variance, the skew and the kurtosis. And our first results were actually quite exciting because it was pretty obvious that we were getting some quite good correlations. So what you see here, somebody said it was a good old-fashioned pointer. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
what you've got here is you've got that flocks which ended up with a lot of birds dying during their lifetime had a much lower mean level of movement. And the ones that ended up, again, with uh, these, these damaged legs and feet or couldn't walk very well, uh, again, um, had this lower mean. But the really interesting thing was that there was a positive relationship between the skew and the kurtosis. So if we look at the mean, that, that sort of makes sense. And if they're going to have a high mortality, they don't, they don't move so well, that makes sense. But what about the skew and kurtosis? What does that mean uh, in, in terms? Why should there be such a high skew and kurtosis for uh, birds that are not able to walk very well or have damaged uh, legs uh, and feet? Now, kurtosis, may or not, actually, it, it's quite interesting. Even statisticians get in trouble with this. Um, it, it basically is a, is a measure of whether of the tails of the distribution. So if you have a, a fat distribution, uh, so there's, there's a relatively, uh, most of the uh, distribution is, is here and the, the tails are not very extreme, that would be a low kurtosis. A high kurtosis would mean that you, you've got these extremes out here that are very different uh, from, the bulk of the, from the bulk of the population. Um, Steve, uh, Steve, who's the engineer, I was a bit worried about he, he lets me use this slide as an illustration. If you imagine a group of runners, women Olympic runners, all running in a race, the mean rate of running will be very high, and because they're all the same standard, they will have a low skew and a low kurtosis. They'll all be pretty much the same, they'll be bunched. There'll, no, there'll, there'll be nobody that's particularly uh, particularly fast, particularly slow. If you then take the London Marathon, where you've got, at, you've got men and women, and you've got uh, professionals and amateurs, and you've got people putting silly costumes on, the mean will be lower, and there'll be a much, much bigger spread. You'll have extremely fast and extremely uh, uh, slow people uh, in relative to the mean. And what we think is going on with these flocks is that uh, if you have a flock with some birds that can't walk, it isn't that they all can't walk. It's that some of them can't walk. Some of them will walk very well. Some of them will walk less well. And some of them will walk really, really badly. Whereas in a healthy flock, everybody will be walking well. You'll have a, a much more bunched, um, a much more bunched um, population. So um, what we think is, is going on is that the kurtosis is, is indicating a lack of uniformity. There's, there's odd, odd, odd ones sticking out uh, as, as really odd. And that is an indication um, that uh, something is wrong. And if you think about it, for disease, if you had a population going down with flu or something, not everybody goes down at the same time. Some people are healthy, some people have gone, gone down with it, some people have gone and it's, it's a lack of uniformity is an indication that some individuals are not doing terribly well. So what we call the statistics of welfare, that poor welfare is low mean movement and this high skew and ketosis, and that high welfare is higher mean. They all do run much faster and they have low uh, ketosis. They are much more uniform uh, if they're healthy is uniform, unhealthy. Uh, is, is, is much more variable. And this, what the software can do is actually separate, uh, on this basis, um, uh, flocks from quite an early age. What, a, what you see here, the zero line, is the mean kurtosis of, in this case, 24 flocks. And if you take the flock with the highest mortality, you'll see that its kurtosis is higher than the mean and the one with the lowest mortality is lower than the mean, and this separation occurs quite, quite sharply at about, uh, about 15 days. So it, it can basically um, separate uh, flocks with high welfare uh, and, and low welfare. Um, and similarly with, with gates, this is uh, looking at birds that can't walk very well, and you can see the ones with the, the flock with the best gates is below average kurtosis, Flock with the worst gates has this higher, uh, above average um, kurtosis. 
Um, You can actually predict which flocks are going to end up with these these damaged hocks, these these uh, these, these, these damaged legs, uh, at a very early age when the birds are only about three days old, before their legs look when their legs are looking fine. You can predict which birds will end up with damaged legs uh, when they're 30 days old. So it gives it's highly predictive uh, of which flocks are going to have uh, which flocks are going to have welfare problems. Um, so, how would a farmer actually use this system? Because we're, we're now interested in seeing whether we can uh, do something uh, that would be really, really useful. So, what you would see on a screen, the, our, our idea is if you have a little tablet or something, you can see it. He would see something like this, which would indicate what normal flocks should look like um, at at different uh, ages. This is this is the kurtosis deviation from the scale median. Um, and you, so you can actually see what they look like. Fifty percent of the flocks would be expected to flow uh, to fall between the two dotted lines. There's quite a lot of variation at the beginning, and then it sort of settles down. But it's quite neat to. This is where you expect the majority of flocks um, to uh, to fall. We can then. Um, uh, see how a particular flock looks with respect to this to this norm. Um, the, I chose a flock which had very bad legs and feet. It had about seventy percent of the birds had something wrong with their had damaged skin on the legs uh, or, or feet. And you can see that the optical flow system picks this flock out as unusual as having a an. A, a kurtosis way outside the norm, very early on, right early on, uh, long before there would be any overt signs of leg damage. So right early on, the, the optical flow system would, would be saying there's something unusual um, about that flow. So what we're hoping is that we can actually have something like this working on, um, on a farm, then every day be able to look to see how a given flock was uh, faring in relation to a known norm and you could then take uh, practical steps, you might have medication, you might do, um, you might do something else. Um, and you can make it even better, what I've got here is I've plotted what birds with a relatively low level of hot bone or damaged legs where they, what their kurtosis would look like, and you can see that the one with this very high level of hot bone falls absolutely outside that, completely outside, right the way through, very clearly odd. It really is able to be alert, uh, the farmer would then be alerted. There's something on about this from, uh, have a good look at it, do some more tests, uh, uh, do something. So basically what we talk about is welfare forecasting, giving people uh, a, a chance to, 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 to take uh, preventative steps before things become really serious. And um, it can predict, as we can see, key welfare outcomes, 
days or even weeks ahead of them actually uh, occurring. Um, and because it's non it, 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 it's non invasive, it's done on young birds, it's possible to actually interview while the birds are still alive, whereas most of the methods, as I say, of assessing welfare that people use at the moment are only really possible after the birds are dead. Uh, we hope it will be widely used as a flock management tool, veterinary tool, research tool. So we were then interested in seeing how, whether we could extend the usefulness of optical flow by seeing whether it could not just detect welfare outcomes, but could it actually detect disease, which could actually be uh, even more useful, it may make it even more useful as a tool for, for producers, make them even keener on uh, we hope, buying it, because they could then uh, anticipate uh, into people they got really good. And we chose four diseases, all diseases of poultry guts, on the grounds that if chickens get diarrhea, and the, the diarrhea makes the uh, litter on the floor mucky, that's going to affect the quality of legs and feet. So there would seem to be a, a relationship between disease and your legs in, the, in this particular case. We chose um, salmonella um, because that's obviously a, a major food hazard for, for, for people. Clostridium, which causes necrotic enteritis. Campylobacter, which, as you probably know, is an absolute bane of the broiler industry. They, they cannot get rid of it. And Imeria, which is a, a sort of a protozoan um, uh, parasite of, of, of chickens. Um, they're all important for the poultry industry. Um, and we can see links between the disease and uh, the kind of uh, what the symptoms that we see. And the way we did this was to sample uh, the feces from commercial broiler houses um, when the birds were 21, 28, and 35 days old. Uh, Hood socks is wonderful invention. You put this kind of elasticated um, cotton stuff around your boots, and you just walk around the house, and it absorbs it, picks up. Feces and mass when something like this. So we did it with boot socks and also picking up um, uh, fresh, fresh feces. And I have to say that of the four, the one that we thought would be least likely to have any effect was Campylobacter because Campylobacter is not supposed to affect chickens. It's a bane of the poultry industry because it's human uh, gastroenteritis, it causes human gastroenteritis. But uh, it, it doesn't, it's supposed not to affect, affect the chickens. So we were absolutely astonished when we got this initial result, which showed that uh, flocks that were infected with Campylobacter uh, had a higher mean and this lower ketosis uh, than, um, than flocks that were infected, uh, uh, that were infected. The blue ones are the ones that were infected. So they have, a, they have a lower mean and this higher ketosis. And my bacteriological colleagues always couldn't believe this because, as I say, Campylobacter is not supposed to affect uh, chickens at all. Um, and so we were very interested to know what happens if we uh, look at a completely different set of farms. Can we repeat this result? And um, the result was uh, not only did we repeat it, it, looked, it became even more significant. So in this case, you can see uh, a, a much higher mean for the, the Campylobacter free than the, the, the infected flock, and this um, much lower ketosis uh, than, 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 the, than for the infected flock. So it does actually seem to be picking up uh, not really kind of welfare, but also uh, disease states. And, and um, uh, uh, it may not be that this is effect, the Campylobacter effect chickens, it could be that what we're detecting is the chickens are feeling a bit off, and they're the ones that pick up the um, campylobacter. It's not clear where, where the causal, uh, where the causal uh, relation actually goes. So it, it probably is the fact that it's affecting chicken behaviour, but not necessarily. Um, and what is so very interesting about this is that the separation between these graphs occurs so early by seven days. Whereas with most, you don't get symptoms, they don't get off Campylobacter until about 21 days. So it actually seems to be more accurate, more of a predictor 
up than the standard, than the standard methods. Um, which is interesting because it implies either that they, that they are infected early or that they can be they're, they're, they recognize a kind of weak or susceptible flock early. It's not, it's not clear which of those um, it, it actually is. But it's, it's kind of sparked off a whole new way of looking at where does Campylobacter infection come from because everybody's been concentrating on biosecurity in the, out, in the, in the growing chickens. In fact, maybe it might be that they brought it through from the egg or uh, caught it really, really uh, early on. So I, I think this is actually quite an important connection because obviously, partly obviously because not having a disease is an important part of, uh, of good welfare. Um, but also because it, imme it means that we can begin when we're talking to producers to say, well, look, we're not, this, this, this uh, bit of equipment doesn't just tick one box, the welfare box. Uh, it, it, it actually is a really, it could be really important. It ticks several boxes, the welfare, the food safety, the better quality product, the early warning of disease, and so on. In other words, I, I think this is, this is the way to get people interested in animal welfare because it is related to things that everyone is interested in. Even if you're not interested in animal welfare, you're interested in eating uh, healthy food. And I think that's really the only way to bring animal welfare to the forefront of, of, of farming and, and keep it there in, in, a, um, in, a, in a safe way, as it were. So basically, we, I think it's, there are a number of things that's really important to, if you want to improve welfare. One is to work with com commercial producers. So as I say, I work with some pretty big companies um, and it, it, they're the key to it. If you, if you can't persuade them, well, then it's not going to happen. It's not going to be improve the animal welfare. You've got to, I think, integrate the behaviour, the welfare, production and disease, so they take notice of these things. And uh, I think uh, the, the way to do that is, is to talk about and to demonstrate the monetary value of good welfare. And as I say, we, we are uh, now hoping to, to uh, use technology to improve welfare, and our, our next step is to actually uh, think about a spin-out company um, that might uh, be doing this, the aim of which will be uh, to stress uh, the, the monetary and commercial value of, of good welfare, and therefore to uh, put animal welfare, I, I think, on a, on a more secure uh, footing. So I'll stop there, and thank you very much. And I'm sorry about missing the video. <laughs> Yeah. Do you have any questions? Um, how are the cameras set up? Are they looking down the length of the shed or do they come from the top and look at the plan view? Uh, we, we put them at about, well, it, it, we try to be at uh, uh, two metres, a, a, a 70 degree angle. So we try to standardise the, uh, the, the position. Um, the reason for doing that is that it might be quite difficult in some sheds to get it quite nice to be above them, but it, you can't always. So that's, that's the reason we've, we've done that. And, and one of the things that we are doing at the moment is to explore how much height angle matters. And does it matter how many cameras you have to you can get more information. So we, we're, doing, we're doing this background experiment. But the, the idea is that it would be something you could post off easily to a farm where they could put it up themselves. So it's, it's, we, we just try and stand it. Yes? Um, how do you So this is quite a nice way <coughs> of integrating the animal welfare with basically commercial interest. And it works very well for chickens. But do you think you can apply something like that to many of the other livestock productions so to be really do this? We, we would very much like to. <coughs> but we've done a bit on... Um, Laying hens, which have a terrible welfare problem, as you probably know, that the European Union has done away with battery cages. And they take battery cages, and one of the things that happens when you take chickens out of cages is they start pecking each other. So we've done some work can you actually use optical flow to predict when an outbreak of fur pecking is going to occur? We've got cameras at the moment on pigs, because pigs have a welfare issue of biting each other's tails. Can you predict from the optical flow patterns when things are going to go wrong? Can you identify the 
groups. Um, so those are two uh, areas which we've sort of explored uh, already. But I, I, th I see no reason, well, I, I can see some reason. Um, I've had approaches for people interested in fish farming. Do you know what fish is? That they're in three dimensions. I'm thinking about chickens and walking around the pool. Um, but, but, I mean, fish farming, lobster farming, all sorts, anywhere where you've got kind of human crowd control, really, as well. But in each case, we'd have to do a validation. We'd have to, to, to ask whether you can get from the um, from from the data the things you really want to, the things that are really useful. But no, definitely, we certainly have to be much more. Yeah. And uh, do you think it's kind of more just alleviating the symptoms of the fact that we are keeping animals in quite crowded conditions and that it wouldn't really, I mean there's a limit to how much good you can do whilst you've got so many animals in such an intense place and that's never going to improve because the emphasis is always on how environmentally efficient, how economically efficient, how the... You you're, I mean, you put your finger on something which is quite important which is that a lot of people would like to see animals given more space. And space is economically extremely sensitive. Uh, we did a, a very large study of about 110 different frogs at different stocking densities that showed that although there was an effect of how much space you there was a much bigger effect on things like the, the quality of the air and the litter in the woods if the, if the, if the humidity was too high. Then got many more bad welfare symptoms and, and that had a much bigger effect on the welfare than actually the, um, the, the amount of space. Uh, and, but you're, you're absolutely right that you could, you could actually um, give them a lot more space and, and people would still say, oh well that's not enough, you've still got to see a, a white a white goat. But I, I think because there is this link between welfare and uh, the health of the birds, that's the, that's the kind of big saving grace of, and, and that, that, that could actually, if, if it turned out, for example, that giving them more space made them healthier, then, then right. But you mean that just, just looking at that isn't enough to ensure the good welfare? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, would you predict that in the future robots will take care of chickens and farms? I, I would hope not because a, a good stockman is a good stockman. A good stockman has a kind of feel for what's going on. And I, at least initially, hope this would be an extension of the eyes and ears of a good stockman rather than a replacement. On the other hand, it, it's very, it, farmers find it very difficult to get good, good people. So this could go on become more important, uh, uh, but I, I, I hope one wouldn't use it to get, a, get rid of good, good stockmen, because that's, that's still 